It's good to be together this morning. I have the privilege of <clears throat> opening God's Word with you today as we've uh, begun a new series this fall, the second week of, of looking at uh, the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, and seeing how Jesus is better in all things. <clears throat> as we do that, as we dig in this morning, as we begin, as we think of the importance of missions, and as we think of uh, just that work that we just saw the video of, that's some really cool stuff happening in Mexico, and uh, it's just cool to see that the impact of our prayers and our support and, and teaching that is going on there, just the hunger for the word. And as we think of, of the importance of missions and, and our own missionaries, such as these that we just prayed for in the various places that they're ministering, uh, that can lead us to think about the state of Christianity in our world. Uh, while it may seem that Christianity is waning in our own country and culture, Christianity is flourishing in other parts of the world. Again, why it's encouraging to see what we just uh, saw in that video. Jesus is building his church. Amen? Yeah, that's good. And we need to recognize and rejoice in that reality. Uh, at the same time, uh, things have changed for us in our own place, in our own country, in our own cultural climate. Uh, there was a time not that long ago when, when Christianity had more of a place of prominence and respect culturally. Uh, even thinking back to uh, when I was in high school, now that's not really long ago, but it is long ago in comparison relatively to some of the students I work with. But uh, when I was in high school, I, I remember uh, I had lots of non-Christian teachers and, and, and friends and classmates and I remember in my grade 12 year, they, them asking, what, what are you going to go do after grade 12, Kevin? And it was always kind of an interesting conversation because I'd say, I'm going to go to Bible college and I'm going to be a youth pastor. And they'd be like, what is that? Or like, where is that? Where are you going? That's kind of strange. Why would you waste your time doing that? But at the same time, they still respected that. They understood that I was a Christian. They, they thought it was a good thing, even though it was kind of weird and something that they didn't want to do themselves. <clears throat> but I think that's, that things have changed a little bit in today's world. I think uh, maybe that's true somewhat, but whereas Christians or, or, or as non-Christians in that time uh, and some of my friends and again my teachers were maybe indifferent to Christianity, I think there's more of a hostility towards Christianity today. Not seeing that, it, that it's just weird or something different, but something that's actually detrimental to the world. It won't gain you any popularity points telling people you are a Christian today. We live in a, a time of the angry atheists. In, in the time since I was in high school till now, there's all these books that have come out, The God Delusion, God is Not Great, these types of books pointing to how Christianity isn't good or trying to build that case. We live in a time of deconstruction. That's kind of a hot buzzword today. Now, there can be a good type of deconstruction where you tear down wrong beliefs about God and build up the truth from what we see scripturally. But there is a wrong kind of deconstruction where we just walk away from the faith completely. We live in a time where, we may, where many think that uh, what we believe are simply silly myths. We live in a time of, of wanting to move away from these, these antiquated ways of the Bible. But the truth is, as Christians, we do believe in supernatural things. We are supernaturalists. We believe in God. We actually believe in original sin and death as a result from it. We believe in Jesus Christ and the necessity to respond to him, to believe in him, to believe the good news about him as the savior of the world. We believe these things. We believe in the resurrection. We believe in the restoration of all things that is to come. And we also believe in the devil and demons and spiritual warfare and all these things that are going on. We, we believe that as we come here on a Sunday morning, as we're gathered right now, unified in Christ, we are actually waging war as we worship. We are waging war against the darkness of the evil one and of this world and of the supernatural world. And we also believe in angels, God's ministers, God's servants. And quite often we can have a misperception or misconception about angels in our culture and in our day. I remember the, the Philadelphia cream cheese commercials. Anybody remember those? with the bagel and the cream cheese. I don't know what that has to do with being an angel or heaven, but it's heavenly. I, I think that's what it was. It's heavenly to eat this cream cheese, right? We, we see that. I actually saw an ad about it last night online. I was like, there's still these commercials? It's crazy. But we all have this idea of, of what it is to be an angel or these pictures of, of, of angels, you know, strumming a harp on the clouds, seeing these types of pictures. Uh, we've, we've seen depictions of angels in cartoons 
where, where you have this character with, a, with this good angel on one shoulder telling them to do the, the right thing. And on the other shoulder, there's this devil saying, no, do the bad thing, right? I've heard countless times people talk about a loved one getting their wings when they die, revealing a belief that we somehow become angels when we die. But humans aren't angels. We don't turn into angels. Biblically speaking, an angel is a created spiritual being. The name literally means messenger, uh, minister, servants. In the first couple chapters of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews uh, tells us that Jesus is supreme and that he is superior to the angels. Jesus is better than the angels. Uh, the Hebrews obviously maybe had some issues with angels as well for the writer to, to take time to, to share these things. They maybe had some misperceptions as well. Uh, last week, we saw how Jesus is better from the very opening verses of this text. He is the final voice. He's the final image. He's the final authority. As, as Pastor Andy shared last week, he embodies the ultimate rule and reign of God. If you want to know who God is, look to Jesus because he is God. And all of Hebrews is really one sermon. If you were to just take this and read it, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour, just sit down and read all of Hebrews, that's, that's it was all this, this one sermon pointing to how, how the salvation that Jesus brings is better. We are saved through the Son and not through the Old Covenant. We see that from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 10. And in this first section, the writer of Hebrews begins to flesh that out. He's showing that, that Jesus' salvation message is superior to the message that the angels brought us in the Old Testament. It's God's final word to us. So this morning, as we carry on in the text, we see this reality that Jesus is superior, or Jesus is better than angels, and thus his message is superior or better than theirs. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read from there this morning. I want to pray, and then we'll dig into the text together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. We thank you that amidst all sorts of things going on in our world, we can come here on a Sunday morning and just rest and just sit back and just breathe and just Take in your word and sit under your word. That's what we're doing. We're opening it up. We're letting it speak. May, you, may this not be my opinion or the opinion of man, but the truth of, that you've, you've shared with us through your word, that you've sent to us. And may you bring it alive by your Holy Spirit in our lives and in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, we, we looked at the first a uh, few verses last week, but I want to read from verse 1 again, just because he's carrying on the same thought here as he continues in the rest of the chapter. So verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Or the, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe you will roll them up, like a garment they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? This is God's word. Just as we saw last week, we continue to see more about who Jesus is in these words. 
Who is Jesus? Who or what are these angels that he's speaking of? Who are we in light of all of these things? And this, these are the, the questions that the writer of Hebrews answers and addresses as he continues to show Jesus being better. And the truth that we see here is, is that God has spoken differently to and differently about Jesus from what we see in the scriptures. If you want to know who Jesus is, look at what the New Testament writers wrote about him. Uh, look at Jesus' own words in the Gospels, the claims that he made. Uh, that's why he was ultimately killed on the cross, because they, they knew what Jesus was saying, that I am God, I am the Son of God. There's no mistaking who he is. And here we see that not only should you look at the New Testament, but you should look at the Old Testament and see that the same is true. As we uh, walk through the Bible this summer, albeit you know, very quickly and just kind of doing an overview, we We saw that as we look at God's word over and over again, all of scripture points to Jesus. All the promises, all the prophecies are pointing forward to him. And in this passage, we see three things. see one more, but we'll see that at the end. But, But these three things, Jesus is the son of God, angels are servants, and Jesus is king, and his kingdom is eternal. So first off, Jesus is the son of God. What's uh, incredible as we read Hebrews is that not only do we see these great truths about Jesus, but we're also taught how to read the Old Testament. He's kind of giving us a class on looking back and seeing how this all relates to Jesus. How so? Because all of what we see here in these verses is the author looking back at the Old Testament to build his argument about who Jesus is. This is what he's drawing from. This is is what he expects his readers to... uh, have heard and to understand. He expects them to have some knowledge of of what he is telling them. And first, he shows us uh, the unique relationship that Jesus has with God the Father. He does this by looking at Psalm chapter 2 and by looking at 2 Samuel chapter 7. So what does Psalm 2 say? Psalm 2, as he quotes it from Psalm 2 verse 7, says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is a psalm that speaks to the reality of of David's descendants being kings. Kings who would be devoted to God's purposes in the world. And we know some kings led in that way. Some kings uh, led in a way that, that revealed who God was. And other kings didn't do that. And as we know from looking at the whole story of the Bible this summer, these promises of the Old Testament were not only speaking of these, these fallible kings of Israel but they were pointing ultimately to the ultimate king, or as the writer of Hebrews speaks here, the superior king, Jesus. So if you look at how the writer of Hebrews breaks this section down, you see that he, he's asking all of these rhetorical questions. He's saying, did, did God say these things about the angels? As he quotes from this psalm, he asks his readers, for to which of the angels did God say these things? He's assuming, again, that his, his readers would know the Old Testament. He's assuming that they would know the answer, that they would know that, that, that God has never spoken this way to anyone else, including the angels. There's something different about Jesus. I'm reminded of, of the lyrics of a song from my childhood, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. As you read in verse 4, as you read in verse 4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. His name, better. He is the son. He is the eternal son. And not only do we read this in Psalm 2, but in 2 Samuel 7. We looked at this summer. This great chapter pointing forward to uh, the better king, the best king, Jesus Christ. In 2 Samuel 2, verse 7, we read, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Not only speaking, again, about David, 
and the line of kings to come from him, but again, pointing to the better king, the best king, Jesus. The writer of Hebrews couldn't be any more clear regarding the identity and the uniqueness of Jesus. There's something different. There's something better. There's something totally unique about him. He alone is the son of God. He alone, as we read last week and as we read earlier this morning, as you can see in these first few verses of the chapter, is the heir of all things, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He alone upholds the universe by the power or by the word of his power. He alone made purification for sins and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is who Jesus is. Only Jesus does this. And this is where Christianity is exclusive. This is where it's different. This is where Christianity is unique as a worldview and as a religion and as, as a belief system. All throughout the scriptures, it is clear that there aren't many ways to God. There's only one way, and it is through the Son. In John chapter 14, Jesus says these words about himself. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What does that mean? It means that he's the only way that you can come in. That's what I mean when I say Christianity is exclusive. Now, let me be clear. Christianity is inclusive in that anyone is welcome. The invitation is for all people to uh, respond and repent and believe and receive the new life that is found in Jesus. That invitation is for all people everywhere. But Christianity is absolutely exclusive as it is only through Jesus that we are saved. He's the only way. It's a big and bold claim, but it is the claim of Christianity. It's what we bank everything on because it's what we see from both the Old and the New Testament in our Bible. It's the story that the Bible tells. Jesus is either the one and only God or he, is, he isn't God at all. And as we read in, in Psalm 2 and are reminded here in Hebrews, only Jesus is the Son of God. Regarding Psalm 2, Dane Ortland writes this. He says, with the coming of the Messiah, this psalm's triumphant portrait of the Davidic throne takes on heightened significance and finds its ultimate meaning. Believers today are heirs of this psalm, and its promises come to rest on the worldwide church and its faith in the true and final Davidic heir, Jesus. Those who take refuge in him have found the only truly safe place in this broken world. Those who persist in resisting God and his rule, even if they are powerful rulers of the earth, will be finally defied and justly destroyed. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the son of God. No angel, no other leader, no other king. Moving along, the author of Hebrews shows us who angels are in comparison to Jesus. He says angels are servants. Look at this in verse 6, the continuation of the argument. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels worship him. Again, he turns to the Old Testament. He turns to, to Deuteronomy and to the Psalms, and he continues to show who Jesus is. Of course, he's above the angels because the angels actually worship him. The angels bow down to him. A question that, that our culture asks about Jesus, and maybe even you are asking this morning, is this. Why should I believe this? Why, why should I believe this stuff about Jesus being the son of God? Why should I believe he's the only way? And ultimately, why should I believe this, this claim that he even rose from the dead in the first place? And when it comes to answering this question, uh, theologian Michael Horton states this. He says, something has happened in history, and we cannot wish it away. It either happened or it did not happen, but the claim itself is hardly meaningless or beyond investigation. It is a question that can be looked into. It's a question that should be looked into. It's a question that is worth looking into. He continues on to, to look at what he calls the facts of the case. He writes this. He says, The earliest Christians testified to the following elements of the resurrection claim, even to the point of martyrdom, even to the point of death. This is true. This is, this is history. Jesus lived, died, and was buried. Three facts about Jesus. The other reality is that Jesus' tomb was found empty after three days. Those are historical truths that we all must wrestle with. We all must decide what to do with. Are we going to take God's word to be his word? And if Jesus was who he said he was, and if, if he was who these New Testament writers say he was, that changes everything for you and for me. 
Because if he is the son of God, he is superior. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to us. He is to be worshiped. He is God. He is king. He is Lord over all things. And the writer of Hebrews is pointing to this truth. As Jesus lived, as he died, as he was buried, as his tomb was found to be empty after three days, there were many witnesses that saw Jesus alive. What do we do with those accounts? What do we do with those eyewitness accounts? Not only that they saw him alive, but that as he gave his parting words to the disciples, he ascended into heaven, where he is now seated at the right hand of God. This is what the writer of Hebrews has in mind as he speaks of these angels worshiping Jesus. Not only worshiping him for who he is, but for what he has done in our world. In, in Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he's reminding them of who Jesus is. And in verse 4 of Romans chapter 1, Paul says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus was already God. Jesus has been God from eternity past. We know this from the Bible. He's he's eternal. He's always been God. He wasn't just declared God. He didn't just become God at some point. But what Paul is saying is is that he is confirming who he is. It was as Jesus uh, uh, did these things that the angels saw him and went, oh, And they worshipped him for it as he was exalted and enthroned. And as they're worshipping worshiping him at the throne even now, going, he rose from the dead. He did what he came to accomplish. And not only is is Jesus unique as the firstborn son of God who who has existed before creation, we also read in Colossians chapter 1 that he's the firstborn from the dead, the first one to rise, the first one to do this. That means, as as Peter O'Brien writes, He's the founder of a new humanity. The resurrection age has burst forth, and it is uh, as the first who has risen from among those who had fallen asleep, he is the first fruits who guarantees the future resurrection of others. Because Jesus has risen, we will rise as we place our trust in him. Using slightly different language, he continues, Hebrews shows that Christ's supremacy has been confirmed in his exaltation. Moreover, his unique relationship to God is especially emphasized. This is, this is why the angels bow down. This is why the angels worship, and we get a glimpse into it. We get to overhear it. We get to oversee it. Again, he is the one whom the angels worship. Now, that doesn't mean that angels aren't important. That's not what he's saying. It's simply saying that they are inferior to Jesus. And as the writer next quotes from Psalm 104, read in verse 7, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, meaning that that God sends his angels to do his bidding, to do his work. They are like the wind or a flame of fire in that they move about as, as God calls them to do different tasks, one of which is to serve God's people, us, if you know Jesus. So that's important. I'm thankful for that, that they minister to us. They, uh, as, you, as it, we read in verse 14, and we'll look at it in a moment, they're ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. They're a part of that work somehow. That's amazing. So Jesus, on the other hand, is is the Lord who stands above them as they do this work. We see this as the writer moves back to describing Jesus, revealing to us that Jesus is king and his kingdom is eternal. Verse 8, but of the Son, he says. So he's talked about who Jesus is. Now he's he's talking about angels. Now he's back on Jesus. But of the Son, he says... Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Again, God speaks differently to and about Jesus. Did God ever say this about the angels? No. What did God say about the angels? Again, they're they're ministers, they're servants messengers. What did God say about Jesus? We've seen a little bit already, but we continue to see the answer by looking back, this time to to Psalm 45 and 102. As we've already seen, when when the Old Testament speaks of the coming king, there are ways in which David and his descendants, like Solomon, exhibited some of these characteristics. One, One commentator lists ways in which the kings would have portrayed who God is. Uh, or the Davidic king 
the Davidic king's rule is like the authority of God when, number one, he reflects God's presence and glory and majesty are ascribed to him. So there are ways when, when the king was ruling in that way, reflecting who God is. Uh, secondly, when he's declared a defender and lover of truth and righteousness, if it's a good king who loves the truth and is ruling in this way. Thirdly, if he judges with equity. Fourth, if his rule or his, his dynasty lasts forever. So we see some of this in the rule and reign of David and Solomon when they were, again, ruling under God's authority, not doing their own thing. But David and these Old Testament kings were not God. They were called God in a figurative way, as, as his representatives. That's what we see in, these, in this psalm. But when the author of Hebrews quotes from this psalm regarding Jesus, he's saying, Jesus is this king. Jesus is God. This is Jesus, literally. Sure, there are ways that, that the Davidic king's rule is like the authority of God, but Jesus is God. That's the difference. That's what he's saying, and it's It's incredible. Jesus is that king. He has come. His reign has already begun. He's superior, and the angels bow down to him. His throne endures forever. His rule knows no end, verse 10. And you, Lord, speaking of Jesus, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like, like a garment, like our old clothes. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a, like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Quoting from Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, the writer of Hebrews shows us Jesus' work in creation all the way to the end of time. Jesus was there laying the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Again, as we think back to, to Genesis chapter 1, and even as we looked at the Bible this summer, this, this sweeping story, we see the Trinity in, involved in creation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then we see these contrasts. We see that, that everything else in creation has an expiration date. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We all, it, it all ends. Everything has its time. But listen to this. Whether at the beginning or the end of the visible creation, the Son who is creator is present. He's active. He's unchanging. Pastor Andy talked about this last week. We, don't, we do not worship a God who is distant, a, a God who set things in motion and walked away. We believe in a personal God who is, who is present, active, unchanging, ruling even now. Everything in creation, including angels, are impermanent. But Jesus is eternal. He is unchangeable. This means that, that you need to set your sights on him. You need to set your hopes on Jesus. You need to look to Jesus because everything else in this life is temporary. Everything else fades. Everything else changes. Everything else expires and wears out. Clothes grow old and wear out. A cloak is rolled up and put away. But the sun remains for how long? Forever. And as Jesus remains, may we remain with him. This is the call of the, this, this entire sermon that we read in Hebrews. In fact, you you see some of the application of these words next week. If you, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but look at this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, so regarding Jesus' supremacy, regarding that he is better than the angels, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. We need to grab hold of this truth. We, we must put our hope in what lasts. Tomorrow we have a day off. We didn't know that we had a day off earlier last week, but now we know that we have a day off to mourn and honor Queen Elizabeth II. I don't know what you think of the monarchy, but I quite like the queen. Uh, either way, the, this moment in, in history is a very vivid picture of this truth, isn't it? Queen Elizabeth reigned for 70 years. It's incredible. But Jesus will reign forever. One of my favorite quotes from the last couple of weeks in, in reading about the queen and just seeing some of the reaction, uh, I, I read from this pastor in England who said this. He said, she was an oak of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. What a life. Now the queen meets her king. Well done, good and faithful servant. He wrote that on the day that she died. And then a few days later, the following Sunday, last Sunday, in fact, he wrote this. He said, there are no transfers of power in heaven. 
No royal funerals. No changes of prime minister. No doubts about whether the new ruler will rule like the old one. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and today we celebrate the unchanging sovereign. Happy Lord's Day. What a way, what a way to begin a Sunday, right? I believe Queen Elizabeth was a good, good queen, but even her reign was temporary. Jesus is king, and his kingdom is eternal. So that is who Jesus is. That is Jesus versus angels. That is Jesus versus any other leader Jesus versus anybody else, Jesus is better than them all. So who are you this morning? Verse 13. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Again, revealing how he's different from angels. Verse 14, look at this. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who inherit salvation? If you know Jesus, you are an heir of salvation. The message that he brings, the the better message. Jesus is heir of all things, and as you believe in him, you become an heir of, of the salvation that he alone brings. The writer of Hebrews begins his sermon telling us that Jesus is the final word to us. And as he is superior even to the angels, his message is superior to the message they that they brought, that they were a part of ushering in in the old covenant. And what is this message? It's the message of salvation. The message that he is superior, that that he is unchanging, that he has paid for sins and guarantees it is finished as he has risen from the dead and reigns at the right hand of God for all time. This this past week, I I read a paraphrase of Psalm 2. We read part of Psalm 2 earlier, but here's, here's what the paraphrase says. The heathens rage, God laughs, but nothing is funny. O kings, be wise. O rulers, be warned. Dust be not proud. Bend your earthen neck, lest he break it. Kiss the sun. Hide from his wrath in him. Again, regarding this psalm, Dane Ortland writes, despite whatever tumults rock our lives today, do we have tumults rocking our lives? Yeah. Despite whatever tumults rock our lives today, David's greatest son, Jesus himself, has been installed as the ruler of the world. One day his kingship will break open in universal acknowledgement and the universal execution of perfect justice. For now, we can go forth in the glad assurance that in Jesus, we will one day leave behind forever the futility of the present. Every injustice in our lives will be undone. So take heart, we are on the right side. So first off, this morning, when you think about these things, what do you do in light of this truth? First off, are you a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you take Jesus seriously? Are you serious about him? And if that is true for you, then live in confidence that Jesus is reigning as the risen Lord, that he is our savior, that he is the eternal one who is better than even the angels. Remember who is on the throne today and forever. Jesus is king and Jesus is better. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth. May you just impress it in our hearts so deeply that we would live in light of this reality, that that it would have a sanctifying effect on us, that as, as we know that you are king, we know that you are good, that you are ruling, that you are reigning. May we live in light of that. May we pursue holiness. May we pursue loving you and loving others. and and living in the truth that our king is the king of all and that your king, your your kingdom never never ends. Your rule never ends. Your reign never ends. There's no changing. We don't have to worry. So give us confidence. Help us live in that confidence today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.